Sunday morning. Somebody famous was here last night. Who was that? Performing? Yeah, my God, I have to compete with him. I have to compete with Google in, in the other room. So thank you, thank you very much for being here. Can I get the clicker? Um, so first thing I'm going to ask, what are you going to gain out of this course? Your course, you, uh, this, this session on Sunday, what are you going to gain? Can anyone guess? We're going to keep it interactive. Any ideas? Okay, the first thing you're going to get is Paisa Vasool. Okay? The first thing you're going to, and why are you going to get Paisa Vasool, I'll tell you, is because this is a normal course that is run over 10 weeks. So this course, when I teach Anant, it is a 10 session ka course. Hai. So this is a summary of those 10 sessions, um, which is why it might go a little fast. They have a lot of things, ideas and concepts in there. Whatever you want to ask, hai, so in between you can ask any question. Okay, Just put your hand up. You want, I want to keep this really interactive because it, after a while, you know, you, you had two days of listening to some a lot of speakers. I want to keep it interesting for you also. Okay, so working out of the box. So, um, as Sir said, you know, office mein jana, boring, I mean, why, who wants to design an office? Has anyone wanted to design an office ever in their life? All of you designers out there. How many interior designers or architects in this room? How many of them wanted to design an office? Very few. Even I didn't think, okay, that I would end up wanting to be speaking and designing an office. So I'll tell you how I got there. But first tell me something. What is the difference between art and design? Who can tell me? Any, anybody? What is art and what is design? Put, just put your hand up and say, it's not a very difficult question. Art or design, what is the difference? Bingo in one. Yeah, anyone else wants to try that? Anyone else wants to try? Anything else you want to add? So I will say this. This is how I remember the difference between art and design. <laughs> okay. And the reason I put this up is because after the architect and a client do a project together, what are they doing? Do they look like they're even communicating with each other? Forget doing anything else with each other. They are often not even communicating. So what happens is, is that business and design often speak very different languages. So I'll just start off with a, with a story. Um, when I graduated from business school, I actually went to a business school. You know, I am standing here giving you a talk on design. I have not, how many design lectures have I attended in my life, I mean, in a classroom? Have I studied in any of the wonderful colleges that you ladies and gentlemen study from? No. Because I went to Harvard Business School where they didn't teach us anything about design. And I came back and I had an office furniture company, which is so much about the design, right? Dealing with interior architects, clients, all the time looking at product designers, furniture designers, design engineers. That was our business. And I hadn't learned anything about design formally. And so then I realized that I have to educate myself. And as I was doing it, I realized that business ki bhasha alag hai, designers ki bhasha alag hai. Or jo design ki bhasha hai, wo hai aesthetics hai, form hai, functionality hai, vendors ke baare mein hai. Or jo business ki bhasha hai, usme efficiency, cost per square foot, head count, space utilization, project budgets, completion, dono bhasha hai. So business alag, design alag. And then, what happens in these two languages? Who is thinking of the people? Actually, no one is thinking of the people. Who are the people in the office? The, the, the people who work in the office, the CEO, you know, the, the, the employees, all, all of the people who are in the office, no one is actually thinking of them. And so, actually, we thought business or design, we will combine it and we will make a new language. And that is what this book and this column did. So that's why I started writing about CEOs. I started writing the column that Sir was talking about in the Mint. It's called Head Office. If you go to livemint.com or you go to my website, I'll have it at the end, I think. Um, you'll find all the columns there or you can look at the book on Amazon. And that was really putting the person at the center. And that is one of the basic rules of design. So today, what you're going to learn, what I hope you're going to see is not just an understanding of workplaces. 
but also an understanding of how the design process works. So here we have a little audio. Can someone help me with that? Can come on the stage with it otherwise? Huh, sorry, just one, one, one more line. This is a C, one of the CEOs who really inspired me. His name is Martin Sorrell. I was interviewed him. He told me his annual report. His business ki annual report, which was a photo of the ideal office. He sketch hand drawing. And that sketch was in company ke annual report mein include kiya tha, 10 years ago. Because he knew there is a link between the business productivity and the space. And for him, it wasn't a cost. It was actually an investment into people. It was an investment into his organization. You know, so he was very, very far ahead in his thinking. And the company that he had earlier was WPP. It had lakhs of employees. But he could still tell me, ha, Shanghai mein aise ho raha hai, Seoul mein aise ho raha hai, apna office is ka hai, Bombay mein apna office is ka hai. There was a whole plan by which the different offices could connect with each other. So this was like a real life thing. It wasn't just the space, right? Today, we are in such a beautiful environment at this university. You're very lucky to be part of it. Now, we'll see what, how we shape some of the places that define our everyday life. So, a very short clip. That is the book. That's basically to give you an idea of what we do. Welcome to everyone who has a bigger hangover than me. <laughs> uh, let's let's go on. Okay. So we're going to talk about offices. We're going to talk about this idea of types of offices. What I call workplace archetypes. Yeah. Then we'll see how these archetypes apply to different examples of CEOs. So I'll show you a lot of examples today. And then there are lessons for us, okay? We're not CEOs, but there's still lessons for any. Even if you're never going to design an office in your life, if you're never going to think about that, these are lessons on how, how we can be better um, professionals. Can you think of what an archetype is? When we think of a princess, we know what that princess, we have a mind, any, any princess that we think of, can we think of what that princess looks like? What is she wearing? Anyone? Elaborate dress, something, some jewelry, some crown, right? So, she, so that's, uh, you think of a princess. You think of when we had those Panchatantra stories, you had that typical poor Brahmin. Can we think of what that poor Brahmin was? What was he wearing or looking like? Yeah, so uh, cotton clothes and minimal, right? So these are archetypes. These are like models of, of people who represent something. They're almost like symbols in a way of, of people. So if just like you have archetypes of uh, people, you can, I believe you can have archetypes of workplaces. Okay, what these archetypes do is they help us distinguish between things. Today, when we, we, because we know what princesses look like, or Disney would have us believe that, um, we can look at a model of a princess and say, oh, that's the archetype of a princess. We can recognize the princess when we see one. Similarly, these archetypes will help you when you walk into an office, when you're going for your job interview, when you're thinking, where am I going to study after I graduate? And when you look at that space, hopefully these archetypes will help you say, oh, this is that kind of office. This is what these people are really investing in. Right? So these are the archetypes. So we'll start slowly, I'll explain. Okay. What essentially, this is the model that I will get into in more detail. 
but what we're saying is that there is something intangible and there is something tangible in a workspace okay and that's what that's what workspaces do but i will explain it but this is just like the one slide that summarizes some of it now let's look at these two pictures of this office first of all can anyone recognize that man in the below it's i know it's a little fuzzy do we need to turn the lights a little less sir i'll ask you maybe you can identify that's a kumar birla okay the the bottom person over there is kumar birla that's his office space the top office space is prasun joshi yeah that's perfect anything similar in these two offices sorry paintings yeah what else i mean it's very spacious yeah it's a it's a cabin but it's a private cabin but it's very spacious what else yeah so there's a discussion table over there there's a discussion table area area here and then there is a desk each of the ceos has a pretty substantial desk right now this is the classic corner office for the ceo ki there are two work settings right there is a desk over there which the ceo sits on nowadays they don't sit very much over there they'll have another discussion area they may have a third area also okay and the whole thing is closed and it's also quite luxurious in this case it it means it conveys a lot of power what what else does this convey to you this this kind of space is somebody if you walked into this kind of space what do you think about the person who's in there sorry power luxury somebody who's running sorry somebody who's got a lot of position status right so these are your traditional offices this is what most ceos when they think of themselves being in power they would they would do right and this is what i call this office is what i call an anchor okay and there are three parts to this statement it's an anchor it's a nourishing office and it's about personal energy it's about the individual okay the the ceo who's putting up this kind of space is investing in his or her personal energy and there's a lot of through nourishing that there's a what i call the classic corner office enclosed hai private hai dual work setting hai matlab meeting table hai aur uh, private desk hai dono hai और उसको काफी पर्सनलाइज किया है बट इट्स लाइक एन एंकरिंग स्पेस दैट इज वॉट दिस स्पेस इज डूइंग एंड द स्पेस इज रियली नारिशिंग इज दिस स्पेस नारिशिंग द ऑफिस ऑफ द पीपल नेक्स्ट टू हिम नेसेसरली इज एवरी वन इन द ऑर्गेनाइजेशन गोइंग टू हैव दिस काइंड ऑफ स्पेस नो राइट इट्स ओनली रियली द टॉप मैनेजमेंट हुआ गोन गेट दिस काइंड ऑफ स्पेस सो इट्स मोर अबाउट पर्सनल एनर्जी दिस काइंड ऑफ स्पेस बिकॉज दैट्स वन दैट्स द फर्स्ट आर्किटाइप लेट्स लुक एट दीज टू these are also ceo offices okay i'll tell you the bottom is the office of uh, harley davidson uh, they had a ceo in india called uh, anup prakash um, biking anyone any anybody is at all been on a, any sort of bikes anybody know about harley davidson yeah ha huh? yeah but what what do you know about harley davidson bikes and yeah it's like it's like it's 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 very it's one of the best bikes one of the most expensive bikes and it's all about exploring your dreams so that is the office of harley davidson in gurgaon uh, the former md anu prakash and up there is a lady called linda gratton now she is a researcher she's also a professor but she has a, her own research company and um, she's based in london and this is her small setup it's what i call a micro entrepreneurship but a global micro entrepreneur so she's global because she has clients all from all over the world but it's a small setup a few like like a dozen people or so now what is interesting about these two offices informal no but there's no cabin nobody has a cabin in fact in linda gratton's case this is such a small office that they sit all the desks are towards facing the windows and then they just have this um, table which opens up whenever they have a meeting and they pull it in right and so that's how they work so there's no it's completely open office and it's 
it's a it, you know then and and what else what else are the two of them doing well are they sitting standing yeah in fact uh, anup has a standing office so it's it's that way it's it's more focused on this so this office is a different it's a it's it's not about nourishing personal energy it's about the organization when a ceo says i want to make an open plan office he or she would probably like a closed cabin but he's he or she is thinking theek hai i need to make something open sab ke liye i am investing in the organization and the office then becomes a tool to say by changing the culture i will and this is the thing i have seen all the time i have seen so 90% of the time i think when a new ceo joins in they'll say i've joined the company as a new ceo i'm going to change the whole office i'm going to change the way we look and feel i'm going to change the way our desks are laid out i'm going to change the way um, all uh, all all the interactions happen right and the choices that they make tell us more about them as people so over these kind of offices when i call them organizational capital offices right they are often open plan very democratic egalitarian sabko ek jaise office you know they 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 don't hesitate between pulling off 150 200 people out of their cabins and they say we'll give you an open open plan lot of shared infrastructure emphasis multi work settings for your generation i hear this all the time these millennials they cannot stay in one place they have to move from place to place throughout the day is that true how many people think that's true put your hand up please how many people think it's true that millennials cannot stay in one place for more than 90 minutes and they have to keep moving very few that means i can keep you here for 3 hours and you won't come complain <laughs> no so but it is a it is a it is a way of designing when people are designing for young um uh for younger students or maybe you all are not even millennials maybe you all are gen z um they are saying that we cannot design an office where you expect the person to just be sitting at a desk they have to have different levels of uh, places where they meet right so this is an organization which is really a tool and it's it's a tool you use tool to build things right so that's what it it is this office this is a uh, used to be mintra's office and that's uh, mukesh bansal who was with mintra what is this office about what strikes you when you look here strong graphics color vibrancy yeah it's it's so what is this office immediately is there one word that would engaging but what is it in terms of business terms what is it doing what what is it about selling what selling product and yeah but going back to which part which part of the business marketing and branding ultimately what we're looking at this is about the brand this is about saying can i through my columns and pillars and walls and you know can i bring my brand to life it is an open plan office if you see mukesh mansa sitting there it is an organizational capital kind of office kyunki wo ceo hai wo ek mamli desk par baitha hua hai uska kuch fancy cabin nahi hai baki office kafi fancy hai but for the he is sitting like that but i think that it's still it's about branding fundamentally and this office for me is a platform right we all understand the meaning yeah we all understand the meaning of the word platform in today's day and age right so you have to be able to uh, communicate a platform is something that allows us to communicate and this sort of office is very very expressive very contemporary okay and very very personalized so this is about brand values what is this office green sustainable what is this what is it this is an office this is an office really what does it look like to you it's a greenhouse looks like a greenhouse yeah and actually there is this is a person is a gentleman by the name of kamal Mit, mittal he lives in delhi this is his office he has actually says that i can grow fresh air in fact he has a book out also how to grow fresh air he's got a ted talk which has become very popular so he has actually established a greenhouse 
at the top of his um, office to filter out all the bad air, to clean out all the uh, bad stuff and the impurities of the air um, through using various plants, but using a lot of other infrastructure also. And uh, and then he's got air inside, and, and honestly, the, when you go inside, you feel that the air quality is much better. So this office is what is it? Is it about branding? Is it about branding? No. Organizational capital. Environment. So that is what. Yeah. So this office is about or being. It says my office is a resource. Just like I have a car and I want a green car, or I have a home and I want a green home, or I want my clothes to be sustainable, I want my office to be sustainable. It's isko main resource. I will treat it like a resource. I will sustain it. And the mindset that is needed is very different. It's about being frugal, energy efficient, standardized. All the resources are consumption monitored. Now, what you see is also while I'm going through this. One will be better. One will be something that one of these will be you would like more. Some of us in the room would like sustainability. Some of us would be preferring brand value. Some of us will react to personal energy. So for each one of us, we will gravitate towards one of these. And in the same way, you will, um, as CEOs, they make the same decisions. So just to go back and answer this question, why do CEOs? Build offices. Now, can someone help me answer this question? Some B CEOs build the build the office to save the planet. They think that by building a green office, they can save the planet. Yeah, exactly. It is the individuality, but what I'm saying is even these individualities can be grouped into three or four different groupings, right? That's what we're going to, that's what we're saying. So what are we doing? When we are designing an office, what do we have? You as a designer, you have these tools at, at your disposal. These are the elements of interior architecture, uh, uh, interior, interiors and architecture that you might be, de uh, that you would be dealing. Of course, there's many more. I've just put a few things down, technology, layout, storage, graphic design, carpets. Your mind is thinking of these tools, these elements, how you can use them, how you can combine them, what to use where, how to lay it out. Why you are doing that is intangible, right? So that's why the tangible and the intangible work together. And the best design offices are ones where the two are aligned with each other, yeah? And that's what I call about this workplace archetypes. So workplace archetypes are where you combine the intangible and the tangible and you have a specific kind of um, asset that is being used. So for example, either it could be nourishing the personal energy type, the Kumar Birla, Prasoon Joshi kind of office at the bottom left, or you have this Harley Davidson kind of office on the top left, or you have the Mintra kind of office on the top, on the bottom right, which is communicating and being branding, or you have the sustainability. I'm not saying that offices can't do all. I mean, what I'm saying is that I think CEOs should think about all of these four things. But eventually, they'd one or two become more dominant. But the more that the CEOs think of all of these, you know, is, is a better office. So for example, if you're zero on one and you're 10 on the other, it shows the imbalance coming in, right? So this is the one slide that I would like you to think about um, and then we will go a little deeper into it. Now, to, how does this mean to you? Tomorrow if you have this information, you say, Uska kya matlab hai? how do I utilize this? So the questions you can ask are, what, what you have to do is to look at a series of questions that you can ask the CEOs or ask the senior management and see how they respond. And you'll see certain groupings coming in. So let me explain. So when you are trying to find out ki which kind of office it is, okay, you go into the uh, no, office and you have to look for signs of things that are about personal energy. For example, 
is it about privacy is it about having your own cabin uh, being able to video conference you know from your space having a lot of artwork decor music books coffee tables so on this is the language of personal energy you know and in fact in my book i even have um, a list of questions specific questions that you can actually ask management if you ever were into a situation where you're going to design an office and you had to ask then this is this is how it would work so you would have this designing this is a personal energy kind of question organizational capital if on the other hand the brief that is coming to you from clients it has these words in it okay open plan office free seating agile okay no a lot of mobility multiple work settings okay all of these different tools if that is the brief coming to you then this office is a building organizational capital so this is how the language changes we started off by saying business and design has to speak a common language no this is the language that connects the two because i have invariably seen that when people say that we want to invest in people this is the kind of language these are the words that come about narrate brand values okay here the language is again different what is what is the, people are talking about this is the typography the imagery how we want to tell stories how we want to narrate ourselves how what metaphors do we want to use again a different brief right a different response ultimately for my mind and this goes to whether you are designing ux whether you are designing products whether you are designing your own cupboard it's all about the brief and the best designers in my mind are the ones who can shape the brief along with the clients they are not the ones waiting to receive the brief they're saying the client trusts me so much i have worked 10 years with the client or i have worked 5 years with the client i've done so many projects together we work to such a level that we can actually shape that brief together right so in order to shape the brief you need to understand how that person is thinking you need to understand how that language is 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 going and this is part of it and sustain it's very very clear i mean when people immediately they talk about natural resources energy recycling uh, all conservation mindset you know that this client is looking for something different right so knowing what the client wants knowing what that client has in mind and how the client speaks this language because for the client i'll go back to this slide these four things energy capital environment brand values these are important because they serve a they, their vision and purpose brands ultimately is what companies are valued on and organizational capital is based on productivity if an organization is not uh, valuable then how are they going to deliver the results what is the difference between a ux designer who works at google and a ux designer maybe even at an adobe you know they may be very different some one may be much more valuable than the other even though both are great companies because of the culture of the company okay personal energy is the ceo's own energy which they have to manage because it's a highly demanding and stressful job and in fact the office is one of the few places where they have some time and space of their own and finally environment because they care because it's good for business so all these four things capital energy brand values environment these are things that are good for business they make business sense ultimately in the long run and when you're putting up a space you know an office space for most companies is the biggest investment that they'll ever make short of buying a company they're not going to change it even if they're leasing the space it's big so that's why it's important to understand these four so now we are going to do a game um where I am going to uh, show you the CEO, and you tell me which kind of archetype it is. Okay? If uh, if it wasn't for Sunday morning and the fact that everyone's feeling sleepy, including me, I would have broken you guys up into two. But you all are now also sitting like this, so we'll just we'll just put people's hands up and let's see how many people get it, or or just shout out loud, yeah. So I'm going to give you a quotation by the person, and I'm going to show you a picture of the office. if uh, anybody is very knowledgeable and reads the mint and can recognize all the 
CEOs and they can even try doing that. Or I could give you a heads up on that. Okay, and then you guess. Meet anyone who gives you, meet anybody who wants to meet you. Do CEOs like to meet people? Can you even meet, no, can you meet the principal of your, you know, of your college if you want to? Is it very easy? Unless you've got, you know, the, the only reasons for meeting a principal usually are the wrong reasons, right? <laughs> it is changing. They are, they, yeah, they, they normally are, yeah, they normally are, but it is very unusual that this person is very unusual, they want to meet a lot of people, okay, because CEOs really are stretched for time, two weeks, three weeks, they can't give you an appointment, they've got a lot of meetings going on, all those sorts of things are going on, right, so this person wants to meet everybody, this is this person's uh, desk, three, three secretaries this person has, because there are so many requests to meet him. So I'll, I will, I'll, I'll give you, let me give you a multiple choice and let's see. Do we think that this could be, oh sorry, and this is the space itself is very simple and not very fancy. Do you think this is Deepak Parekh? Who knows who, we know who De Deepak Parekh is? Huh? You were thinking it, so you answered my question. I was going to give them a multiple choice, doesn't matter, it is Deepak Parekh, yeah. But what kind of space is it? So this is the Deepak Parikh. Let me tell you about his space first, then you tell me whether which, which archetype it is. Okay. So this is his office is very very simple. He he's the head of HDFC uh, Bank and HDFC as we know, and he's also worked with. Um, sorry, excuse me. You want to say something? Um, it's uh, he's also worked with um, you know done lots of projects on the government for many things. So he's kind of Mr. Fix It for the government in many many different ways apart from what he just does. But if you see his office, he's got this Ganpati at the back, which he's had for like 30 plus years, 35 plus years, saying that I value loyalty. And he's got this yellow uh, compliance board. Um, you know, when we see that accidents, we have that sign we're saying there's been an accident. So that board is actually not just saying an accident, it's showing that it's, it has the word compliance on it and it has the slippery slope, showing that compliance and ethics and values can be a slippery slope and you have to be careful. So he has this upfront on his desk, of course, you know, so what kind of space is this between the archetypes? Is it a green, how many people think this is a green space? How many people think this is a branding kind of space? How many people think this is, of which one? Okay, why do you say that? Now, what makes it organizational capital and what makes it personal energy? The values, yeah. And anything about the meetings part? So, the interesting thing, anybody wants to talk about the significance of the meetings? Why did I highlight the meetings part? No, so basically, see, ultimately what you do when you're in a corporate is a lot of the time you're meeting people, okay? Your energy, your personal energy goes into that. Even as designers, you will find that. You are collaborating with your colleagues. You are, you know, talking to whatever people, are, uh, your clients, you're going to be looking. So meetings are a big part of energy, your personal energy. And people often say that, too, you know, there's too much time going into meetings. So I think that Mr. Parikh, what is interesting about him, is that he found a way to manage his meetings, okay? So his room itself is calm, it's good energy, but he's got these three people who deal with all his requests. So he's designed a system to, to make it. So I put him in that personal energy part because despite being one of the busiest people in corporate India, he's also extremely accessible. Next one. Now, I mean, 40 emails a day is probably not even 1% of the WhatsApp traction that all of us have on my phone, on our phones, right? We're probably exchanging hundreds of messages all the time. So there's a CEO who gets, he, he said he was getting 500 emails and he reduced it to 40 emails. And he, he said that I did this by telling the people below me that I don't need to be getting emails. My job is to take decisions. You have to, certain emails can be sent to people, but I want to be meeting people and I want to be taking decisions. 
and not sitting in front of my room having 500 emails to look at every day. Okay, and those emails need to be looked at by the, by the people below me. Anyone knows who he is? Tara Sands chairman, yes. And uh, this is his office actually when he was the head of TCS, Tara Consulting. This is Chandra and he's a rock star. There's really no other word for him. He is a total rock star. He can just remember of all the people below him, how they need to be contacted, how they need to be good. He's so good with people, right? That's why when I say, when we think of offices and we get bored and we think, you know, what an off, why does an off, why do, off, do offices look all like? I said, no, because they're about people. Offices are fundamentally about, about people, relationships and companies. And he's one of these people. Recently, Bombay House was in the news also. I don't know if you all saw that they actually had a big refurb. So both Chandra and uh, Deepak Parekh, I put in the area of accessibility. And for me, that is the one of the most important parts of these workplace ar archetypes also. How do you manage your personal energy and how do you align your space to do that? So in fact, uh, what I wanted to show you also is that big TV at the back. Uh, Chandra, in fact, he video conferences two to three times a day very often. He will never do long, you know, he'll never do these long-winded conference calls that everyone does. You're on the phone for like four hours, it keeps going. I mean, these are these happen a lot. He'll, he won't do those kinds of things. He'll make his communication very effective. And actually, he's not somebody who's necessarily a very good communicator, personally. But he just, the way he communicates with his people is fantastic. So somebody who says the conference rooms are named after Krishna and there's, you know, we are like Arjun in the battlefield. Nidhi, don't answer. This is the space. A lot of, it's like that Prasun Joshi kind of office in a sense with a lot of paintings. Conference rooms. Arjuna, he's the most pure desire to have. So is this Kishore Biani or could this be Ajay Piramal? Any answers? Do we know either of them? No? Yeah, that, so that's actually my uncle Ajay, who is also associated with Anand. And um, tell me something, why does he have Krishna and Arjun? And he also has a Buddha. Why was a conference room named after Krishna or rather after Arjun? Sorry? Branding in what way? Who said branding? Yeah. What is he trying to say? So that's a kind of religious thing that you believe Krishna has certain values and huh? No, let's go back to Krishna and Arjun. Where do we encounter Krishna and Arjun in our scriptures? Battlefield, yeah. And which battlefield? Which do we can we? Mahabharata and specifically in Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, right? So, any idea why? Yes, so exactly. So basically, the office is the Karnbhumi. The office is where we work. And that is also the battlefield that we have. See, what, what he's trying to say and what Bhagavad Gita is trying to say is there is a battlefield in all of us. Whether that's your, you know, that whether that's your family, that's your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, that is your school, that is your college, that is your job. We have these battlefields in our lives. What is the whole idea of making the office like this? It's very peaceful. Because ultimately, what does the Bhagavad Gita say, right? That we have to react with peace, not let our emotions be controlling us. And, hello. And especially when, um, when you are in a business kind of decision, you are, the conference room is very symbolic because that's where negotiations happen. That's where people come in from outside. That's why making these decisions that um, become difficult for, you know, that, that are challenging to execute, right? That's what the challenge of life, that's what it represents. What's going on?
Okay, fine, that's fine. So, so that's the idea that what we said it's not just values of course when we say when we are playing to Krishna we are saying we play it's a higher power but the space the role of the space what is the role of the office is to keep us calm be meditative be give us that give us that sense and that can apply to your it should apply to your hostel room right it should apply to you know your 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 home uh, your your the, your everything so that's that's why he's named it so now that's about taking spirituality in, into the workplace. So now what kind of archetype is this? Is this uh, where, which, which area is it in? Personal energy, absolutely. Because this is really one about aligning your personal energy with what I would, you could call spatial energy, right? The energy of the space and the energy of your personal mind are completely an, aligned and it's very, very nourishing. It's an extremely nourishing space. I deeply believe we need to remind people this is the most honorable thing you can do. Um, I will only feel good if people say the mission statement is not a, the mission statement is something you have to take seriously. It's not a bunch of empty words. And uh, the mission statement basically says that it's all about business being a good thing to do. Okay, so it's the mission statement is saying it's a, it's a good thing to do. This is the space, so it's quite large. It's got that big desk that we talked about earlier. You know, it's got art and paintings. What's interesting though, it has a model of an architectural model is there in the space of this person. Okay, so there's a new building coming up and that model is there in that, in the office. And ultimately this is, the person Nitin Noria, he is the dean of Harvard Business School, um, and for me, you know, this statement was all about purpose. Okay, it was basically saying that the mission at, at Harvard Business School is we educate leaders who make a difference in the world, and hopefully positive difference. Some of them do make a lot of negative difference also, um, like George Bush, but. Uh, but the idea is to make a positive difference, okay? Now, what do you think this is? So he's a leader who's really thinking about the campus. He's thinking that what will the campus say? What is Tata Hall about? He's got this whole structure, he's putting it up. And actually he told me, he's like, Aparna, I could, he could, you know, he could pretty put, if he wanted to, he could build 20 buildings or 10 buildings in a year because there's a lot of people who want to put, 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 put up buildings on a campus. And now anybody in a university setting will know how important the university campus is, right? Because you go to a campus and you see what it's like and you see what, you see what is uh, the, the, the quality of education based on that. You judge it. So what do we think? Where is Nitin Noria? Which, uh, which quadrant is he? Uh, sorry? Some brand, brand value, some people, anyone else has got a different opinion? Organization, yeah. So who's saying organization, and why? If you have a mic actually down there, it might be more terrible. Thank you to everybody who joined upstairs. We are now talking about different kinds of CEOs and different kinds of spaces. So I hope you get to just understand this going along. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, no. So I think. Uh, because he's focusing on the fact that what is Harvard about and what is the mission that they are uh, working towards and he wants to make sure that the space exudes that and so everybody walking in through the uh, doors of that institution gets to feel that. So it's about making sure that every person in there also feels that. So it's about creating a sense of shared values as well, not so much just the personal aspect of it. Yeah. I think it, for me it was really about the organizational capital because the capital, we'll talk about what is organizational capital in more detail. There's branding is certainly going on but sometimes branding is, it's at a more, um, it's at a more sort of slightly more superficial level. Whereas when you think about this capital, he's really using the space as a tool 
he is saying that I am going to build, use this idea of buildings to build this whole sense of community, to build what it means to be at Harvard, right? And I think that this is a decision that universities, you know, take with very seriously. And for him, it's built around the sense of purpose. Okay, it's not. If, if I was just building buildings, and to illustrate some values, it may not without a sense of purpose as much. I might have said, okay, it's just branding. But because it goes so deep and fundamental, um, and if any of you ever have the chance to go and walk in that campus, it's it's very interesting to see how it's uh, the old and the new all have been combined. Okay. So quite a long quote. This is uh, a lady who says, uh, if you're approachable, if you keep your line of communication open, you get to hear what you need to hear. But if, if you make yourself approachable, then people will be with you. They will talk to you. They will open up. Okay. And she had to be one of the most favorite people I interviewed. Um, is just, I think we should all recognize her. Yes. No. Arundhati Bhattacharya, former FBI. And uh, finally managed, took me two years to get an interview with her. Um, so, you know, don't worry about that internship if you don't get the, the first one that you look for. Um, but she is uh, really funny, very authentic, you know. And this space, as you can see, is also traditional. It's like the typical CEO space in the sense it's got, we talked about the meeting table and the, the desk. Um, but she is really about authenticity. You know, she had a big Rabindranath Tagore poem over there. Um, she had a list of all the people, this was the interesting one, who had worked at State Bank, all the State Bank chairmen, they have, they have them there over there. Her view, when she said, I changed the, changed the way my desk was facing, my desk is taraf tha, I usko badal di, taki main RBI ka building ko dekh sakti hu. And you know, uh, State Bank is, is obviously governed by RBI. So she's saying RBI, Reserve Bank of India, has literally oversight of me. They can literally see what I'm doing sitting in my desk. Okay. And she's also very relaxed. She said none of the other, uh, none of the other uh, uh, predecessors had changed their cabin because they did not want to sit outside while the cabin work was being done. But I, she said, I sat outside. My cabin work got done and I came in there. You know. So where is she with all of this? Where, where would you put her? Where does she fall? What kind of archetype kind of CEO is she? Sorry? Yeah, personal energy. Any anything? Any other? I think this, she's someone who also she for, for me she's very much at the cusp of that because because she's true to herself, she has she she will be herself. Like she'll tell me, you know, ki, you know, I uh, I have this frizzy hair and I don't want my photo shoot done today. Because sometimes what happens is not that I care about what I look like, that people look at my frizzy hair and they think I'm getting frizzy in life, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting little like frazzled or something. So, uh, so I told her, yeah, you know, I know what it means. Sometimes you just have that bad hair day, you know. So I mean, she's a CEO, you can have this kind of conversation with her. So she's a very organizational capital person, also focused because of that whole, there was so much of SBI in her cabin. It wasn't just about her. There was so much about the having the you know what that what it meant to be a chairman um you know facing the rbi you know how the things that she did and the auth the uh, authenticity comes and we you know we talked about purpose also it's frankly you can't be purposeful if you're not authentic okay Agar, if you you need to know and be true to yourself to figure out what what is it that you want to do in life so that's uh, she was a very interesting person for me so getting people to go into meeting rooms, sometimes it doesn't happen, there's, you know, culture. This is the kind of space which we're told that, you know, people like to work in the high back kind of space. Any guesses where could this, where could this be? It could be a lot of these places. Who wants to work in spaces like this? Who doesn't want to work? Huh? Everybody wants to work? They are nice, very nice spaces. And this is Kavin Mittal of Hike. Um, and he has also, he doesn't have his own office. He works like this. And this is the thing that has changed so much in India over the last three years is collaboration. Like I couldn't have imagined when I started off writing this series, I've been doing it for almost like 10 years. 
that how people have really come out of their cabins, but they've also found quiet places for people to work. Conventional companies, even companies like Airtel, Bharti, you know, um, or even these financial fintech companies, some of them have just got really creative about the way they work. So collaboration is something that, you know, is really, is really, really working. And I think this is quite clear which one it is, but what archetype is this? Huh? Louder? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the classic organizational capital. Using the office as a tool to build your culture, to build, using the spaces as a way for people to have conversations with each other. So this was one of my favorite CEOs. I really enjoyed meeting him now. He's moved on to a different place. But somebody who really enjoyed, and uh, that's him. That's Akshay Kothari, who was from Ahmedabad boy, in fact, I think, um, who was a classic engineer, went to Purdue to study engineering. And then he um, ended up uh, doing a course at Stanford where he went for his master's on design thinking. And he said that's the course that changed his life because it made him understand about empathy. And so he's a product developer at LinkedIn. Um, and you know, it's really interesting the way they do things. Their, their spaces again look like this, very nice places to be. So all about design thinking. Now where does design thinking come in? Huh? Sorry? It's a buzzword, but which of these are, which, of, which, which archetype is it? Is it, is, it about, it's, is it about personal energy? Is it about environment? It's obviously not particularly about environment, but where do you? Personal energy and branding. So I put it, I put it, it, it helps things become a more narrative. So I put it more in the branding side, where because it's, it's about getting closer. But it, there's a cusp also with, for me, in organizational capital, like, because it is about just thinking, the, just helping companies to think very, very differently, but more in, in terms of the branding. So DJ who fuses. So this is a space, they have cool things like this, a pool table and a conference room. So this is actually a space of uh, Rajiv Mehta, who is a former head of Puma. And um, he is uh, sliding down the slide. And what, ha what they had was, what happened was essentially they had the second floor, uh, which was, and the first floor, which were not connected except for there were, there's some stairs. But he said, it's going to take too long for me to go up and down. So I said, so he said, let me just put a slide there and I can just go up and down. Everyone actually does use this slide. Huh? Okay, so so this is pretty clear, right? Like this is archetype wise. Which archetype? Brand, no? This is entirely about brand because what he's saying, joy and energy are, are you know, we are the DJ. We fuse sports and lifestyle together, and that joy and energy is there, and we have to make it experienced in the office. It's not that you just walk into the Puma office and you think, okay, you know, it's, it's on the walls. You actually experience it. You have rock climbing there. You have sports going on there. Everywhere you look, you experience what it means to be a sports person. And he's like, that's why, you know, that's what, that's what it takes to work at a company like that. Now, where can creativity should be everywhere? Business, supply chain, marketing. Who's this? What, what is this company? Lego, yeah. And this is Bali Padda, who was the CEO for um, not very long, but he's a person of Indian origin, but then he grew up in the UK, and he was the CEO for some time. And everything is Lego, right? It's complete. Look at the seal at the back with a table. And this is the cutest, one of the cutest things I saw at his table was, this is a mold to make leg, Lego bricks. Okay, so you know you have plastic mold, you have injection machinery making molds to make plastic bricks. So he actually got his his uh, colleagues in the manufacturing team actually made one for him, and they put all his qualities like he's a really good you know good colleague and things like that. They they actually inscribed on there and they made it for him. So yeah, so what is this essentially? What is this? What is this aspect of 
uh, these are obviously brand values but this is storytelling which today actually has become really important because we are all telling stories we are how many of us tell stories about ourselves through facebook instagram can we just put a can i can i see a show of hands how many of us are telling narrating this narrating these stories all the time through through either facebook or uh, or instagram and i'm not talking about just like whatsapp and snapchat and all that but actually stories that we're telling about each about ourselves to the world yes some maybe not that many some maybe but the thing is storytelling today is one of the most powerful means of communication we have and that's how people experience us right that's how they digitally or virtually today you are experiencing me through being on here i'm telling you these stories of these people you could go online and look for it you could do it through a mint article there are different ways to experience right so storytelling is one of the most powerful ways today to do it and companies that are clever are using their spaces in that way to actually they have powerful brands and telling those stories so what is being green about right it's about being frugal and not wanting to waste and this is meher padam ji's office very simply the head of thermax and she knew exactly how much water was consumed you know in the building how many times people went to the loo and how much water was recycled and how the lifts used to go up and down and which kind of bricks and fly ash were used in in making her exact building she knew all of this for most ceos it's just fine print they don't know it and this was her space in pune that's her very interesting lady also from maybe a little bit from the personal energy part is that she had this lovely photo at the back which is showing uh, uh, two hands in prayer and i asked her why do you have that you know sign why do you have that drawing and she said you know just to show gratitude and you know i thought that's what that's amazing because this is a lady who lost her father very early and she lost her brother and then she and her mother were running the business and to have that she's got that what i call the attitude of gratitude um and she she had that in the office and just see i mean see how simply she's dressed also right and what a kind of simple person she is so the frugality is that you may call it kanjusi also but she calls it frugal is coming from that mindset of how do you make something from nothing how do you use even that waste and make it better so she's obviously green and just a last couple more so i read on weekends flights in the car gym i always have a book with me you know this is the kind of ceo i love right it's probably like 5% of the ceos that i met the ones who really like to read and who have lots of books <laughs> and this so it's really so sweet is that he actually takes quotes from all the books that he likes he asks his assistant to um uh, type them out in a paper and he sticks them in these hand bound books cloth hand bound books and he is harsh mariwala of mariko and uh, really you know really interested in life even he's also getting on in his years and for me for me the space was about learning and renewal you know it was not just about books i have met ceos who are into nature or art or music or other things for him it was being finding a space to renew himself and that space his office was almost like the library that you go to you know um we may go to library because we just want to sort of uh, fall asleep somewhere but for him it was uh, really a place that he would renew his energy so clearly which which category is he in yeah sorry personal energy yeah, absolutely and i and i think it's important that for all of us we think about uh, spaces being a source of that personal energy right going to a particular space going to the gym going to the parlor if you have to going wherever you want to 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 have that sense of renewal um and doing that on a regular basis actually so somebody said i love this i would never trade it i've got this amazing pulse yeah so uh, google is the kind of office you expect it to be like amazing graphics and all sorts of things going on and all over the place lots of food everywhere for people to eat very colorful but look at where the ceo works standing station yeah rajan anandan it's there online everything is online ha huh. 
So, the idea is that it's just, why is Google doing this? Anyone thought about it? Any ideas? Why is Google doing these crazy wacky offices? So basically what Google says is that we want people to feel that they're on college campuses and they're free and they can kind of, they're, they're not restrained or inhibited or any of that. But what Google is also doing is very clever is that they have certain targets that they assign to people, you know, and they have pretty demanding on those targets that they expect people to achieve. So what they're saying is we're giving you, we want you to climb up that mountain and we're giving you the oxygen tank. And the oxygen tank is the lovely office space, one of the oxygen tanks, there are many of them. One of them is the, of, is the uh, office space that helps you climb, climb that up. It's not like we're saying go climb up Everest and we're not giving you the tank, right? So it's, that's their way of looking at it and that's why I call them integrative thinking. So where, do, where would you put the thinking both creatively, thinking both commercially, putting, they call themselves smart creatives. But this is, this is their way of being able to work. So, yeah, it's not just, but it's not just want to leave, it's, 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 they, they, they come up with stuff and that, that really, but it's also saying that, look, we're making this investment into you, now you have to deliver to, for us, right? It's clearly, it's not just that you're going to go have fun, you have to perform. If, same thing as a university building, you're building this beautiful campus. You want to attract students who can deliver, who can give you, a, who will go off and do things that are amazing, not just students who can just enjoy it and not do something, right? So it's this integrated of putting both things together. So where do we put him? Where, what sort of type of, uh, what sort of workplace architect? Yeah, I'm, very, I'm glad you said that because it's, it's actually not just brand values because when you first look at this picture, this is branding. Right, but it, this is not just, this is branding and certainly Google has a very powerful brand through its campuses. Its campuses and its offices are like a brand in itself. But they are there because they are fulfilling this organizational thinking objective. So that's it, we've shown a few, let's see how much, I don't know how much time more we have, but we can go on. So what I'm trying to really say is whenever you think, if you ever think, you know, offices are boring, look at this, just nine people and they're all working so differently. Each space is different, right? And the insight is really that context will shape behavior. The context that you're in, how and why leaders do what they do, that's really what we've been looking at. Now, I'll just talk a little bit about work lives. What does this mean to you and me? Okay, now we're not CEOs, we may not ever be CEOs, we may not want to be CEOs, right? And that's absolutely fine, that's, uh, that's great. One is nourish your personal energy, okay? So meetings, do you feel that meetings are the death of speed or do you want to meet anyone who wants to meet you? You have to decide. CEOs take a call. How do you make yourself accessible and collaborative? Now this happens honestly when you're in your current role. Like I work very closely with a graphic designer who does my, uh, a lot of my work including these presentations. She's a student, she's talented. But what she's not good at doing is understanding how much time she's going to take to finish something and how many other things she's got going on. So making that, being able to understand that part is also a big part of being a professional. How disciplined about technology and communication. We started off this uh, event with somebody saying, oh, you know, if somebody could kind of get these kids not to use their phones for like one minute or something, it would be huge. <laughs> but I'll just say that, look, Whatever discipline you have, you have to follow it, okay? Because the people I've seen from all these CEOs, it was very clear. Some CEO says, I'll only check my emails in the morning, then I have got the day to do my other stuff. Um, somebody says, I'm checking it all the time. Somebody says, I just don't want much email. So question is, are you distracted by tech or are you in control of it? And that is going to be a big aspect of your success, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, yeah? And of your own happiness, if I say so. Um, Self-renewal. So, how many people here do something apart from their studies, like more than three days a week? So, it could be a hobby, it could be exercising, it could be, I don't count hanging out with your friends, talking on the phone, watching movies, listening to music, not too much of that. Do something else that they do it like three times a week. Can anyone put their hand up if they do that? Volunteering, it could be whatever. Does anyone just want to give me a couple of things that they do? 
just tell say what they do pay huh bake anyone else walk meditating guitar yeah that's great just don't stop guys and please keep doing this because you know it was amazing how many ceos that i met had this like somebody for somebody he had books somebody had plants like he could tell me 25 types of plumeria i can't even name one you know somebody had art these are things and you're at that stage in your life and you should be doing a lot of it fitness even i'm doing a lot to get fit now but it was re really incredible that chandra who was 50 he said that i'm fitter now than what i was um, 10 years ago uh, captain uh, vinit uh, sorry vinit nayar of uh, hcl technologies of tech mahindra he said that i i would exercise daily i made sure that when i joined my new company that they had a gym right next to where i was um captain nayar before he died he's 89 years old and he used to shoot these basketball hoops with his uh, uh, with his trainer and he wore these uh, nike balance trainers to work um really inspiring you know so the steps to personal energy are i think these are five things that will matter for everyone okay whatever profession you are meetings communication technology self renewal and fitness you will have will be a part of your life everywhere so please try and accommodate that second i have learned that organizational capital is really important and for i think designers should understand the intangible and the tangible aspects right so for example you 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 look at this office called swiss re this was a case i recently wrote and i really enjoyed it they put a staircase something as old fashioned as a staircase right in the middle of their four floors because it was the best way for employees to connect with each other right now this is a digital age and you're putting a staircase right in the middle of a beautifully done staircase as you can see on the sides of the staircase they had places where people could sit and and chat all different kinds of meeting spaces and what it does is combine all of this that basically that organizational capital is a combination of all of these different things some the tangible workplace design the tangible technological infrastructure and the intangible workplace practices culture and values hr policies structures all of these different things right so it's the tangible and the intangible that go together finally workplaces tell stories they are a narrative medium so we talked about harley right and how iconic harley is so harley has these fuel tanks that they've got at the reception they've got these shields that are uh, you know the even though the the jali is looks like a kind of indian style jali if you look closer there's a there's a shield over there the of the harley logo um they've got this uh, bike uh, the handlebars of the bike in the bathroom so workplaces are really telling stories in a very very creative way and how is it that you can work with you know your clients to to, to deliver those stories finally um sustainability is a strategic decision we talked about that about the in terms of the archetypes this is the jaguar uh, manesar headquarters for the shower and bathrooms you know jaguar company we've all heard of um uh, it really looks like it's going to fly like it looks like an airport or like a terminal when you go there and it was meant to be some sort of bird and basically frugality can be based in uh, sustainability can be based either you think of it in terms of being frugal or in terms of the way jaguar was thinking that we want something very much around wellness or about agility so th these are the different routes so that's it on the workplace archetypes front building sustaining communicating and nourishing now we can either stop about or i have a bit on characteristics on design thinkers what yeah okay is Are we going to are we going to go on for another ten minutes or so? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so this is so essentially what I've done through this is you know also got you to think through the last part about how you do and w uh, what you do, right? Not just why you do it. Uh, sorry, not just what you do. So what you do is all known. Like you're a student, you're taking on projects, you want to look for internships, you you're looking to you know you have obviously your social life, you've got your family life. those are the things you do in terms of what you do but how you do that how you manage your energy 
how you manage your time those are the things that i would like you to think more about and of course if you're interested you know some of the case studies in the book will highlight that more okay so i will switch a little bit away from this workplace um, archetypes uh, model and talk just about how i became a design thinker and what i've learned from it and i hope some of this is uh, helpful to you so i was nowhere near being a design thinker for most of my life i don't know if many of you accidentally went into en engineering and then moved to design thinking or also found your way through other through other routes but i went to uh, i went to oxford uh, to do a liberal arts program i came and worked at my family business vip luggage um i also studied at harvard did an mba which earlier on um uh, i as i said earlier i didn't have any exposure to design and then i had to run this office furniture business and so i made this complete uh, change at that time one pivot actually from harvard to bp ergo in terms of running understanding what design is and really embracing design and talking to all the people who interacted in our business but then about 10 years ago i switched completely from this path of the business path and got into the idea of being a columnist and i i i i don't think you should i would request you to not go back to your parents and said we had a speaker today who said that she went from being a ceo to being a columnist and a journalist because your parents are not going to approve of that but i can tell you for me it was a very good decision because i was enjoying being with my children i've also more more importantly i've always enjoyed writing more than managing people um so it's been really uh, it's been a really good transition and uh, that was our uh, that was just a couple of pictures of our business we took part we were the first indian company to take part in a foreign exhibition on furniture one of the world's biggest trade fairs and this was in 2004 that was me with my team um a long time ago now um but it was obviously a great experience and the ergo the brand still um is very valued um by by those who remember it but then i got this what i call the portfolio life okay where i teach i speak i write and i give um and frankly when i give which is more the philanthropy that i do i'm actually getting more than i'm giving because it's been such a learning exercise so these four all intersect at various different ways you know and um, i should have actually added this this is a bit like that a japanese ikigai i don't know if you've uh, seen that picture of you know some things you do for passion some things you do for money some things you do for um you know other reasons and each of these i do for different reasons so what have i learned about life is one is that it's no longer the ladder it is the jungle gym so i was on that ladder going you know straight up going from oxford to harvard to you know being an mba being a ceo doing all of that right and and then i when i started writing i became this jungle gym career i was moving laterally doing different things and so all of this was really um very very interesting and i had to kind of carve this whole path and somewhere along the lines i learned what it meant to be a design thinker and it has changed my life it has really changed my life in a way that i couldn't have imagined so i think we all get taught that the heart of design thinking is empathy okay and empathy frankly makes you humble because when you are a ceo you have constantly been given a lot of status prestige people th wanting things from you uh, you are in a position to make decisions there are people reporting into you there are people's lives who are directly affected by you but when you are a design thinker you are going at the level of the people that you are discussing if i'm doing a story on you know urbanization and low income housing and slum dwellers i have to go into those people's places and understand what they want and be at whatever level they are and it makes you a lot more humbler because you appreciate life from a different point of view that humility allows has allowed me to keep an open mind and that's really important because you know i think you can start getting rigid so it's really really important for me to 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 have felt that to keep this open mind that curiosity that open mind makes me very unafraid to fail so i can take on different things and and do different projects based on this not not being so of uh, you know being fairly unafraid to fail and then because you're unafraid to fail then you have a very optimistic and positive mindset right so each of these is le leading one into the other 
and because we are optimistic and you know positive what i have really found is that i can connect the dots to reframe the problem and this is what i think is the core of my design philosophy and there are many others but i remember steve jobs saying that really it's about connecting the dots so being able to cross pollinate like the bee over there and for me it's been about finding this intersection between design and business that has really allowed me to create a new language for the way people think about at least about workspaces and it's allowed me to reframe that problem and this is one of the best slides that anyone shared with me and there's a dutch designer oops there was a dutch dutch designer mark de roo and he shared this with me and he said what typically happens with business thinking is that you know you think of all the problems and you try and jump to a conclusion or you want to find one conclusion to solve all the problems whereas in design you actually go start going understand okay you broaden your understanding of the problem like the triangle that we see over there you list all the problems that you might see you think of all the possible solutions and then you find one which is obviously a longer process but that's that's what i think the the better process that you arrive at so that's what design thinking in terms of reframing or just to instead of doing linear thinking you have this more connected and social thinking that you do so that's the cross pollination that really worked and why i'm stressing on that is that there's a beautiful book called 10 faces of innovation by um, a tom kelly of ideo which talks about different types of designers and how you solve problems some people are artists some people are inventors some people are caregivers some people are storytellers and the cross pollinators is 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 one of those personas or one of those in fact archetypes that he comes up with so what that ha- what the other thing that's happened is when you start doing this when you start doing design you think small you think about the next lecture i'm going to give and how i can make that better rather than saying i'm going to redesign the entire curriculum right i'm going to take it small and go big and having this ability and why the chair is there because you know in a, in in architecture the two things that are most designed are buildings and chairs and they are both working at very different levels of scale right but you can really the ability to move from one to the other to think big and to think small that is what i think any successful designer uh should be should do pursue craftsmanship mastery and excellence rather than competition so the competition is with yourself right uh it was really interesting i went to see rajiv bajaj who runs bajaj auto and he had a very interesting office where he had his typical kind of we talked about the ceo's desk and cabin and uh, sorry desk and conference room and um his um, me- meeting areas but he also had a small studio space at the back in the balcony where all his people would get together and they would discuss products and they would discuss what they're going to come up with and it was like almost like a craftsman studio and um, i think this is the idea that you're doing something because you want to do it for its own sake well this whole idea of being a karma yogi that we talked about karm karm bhumi and karma yogi rather than worrying about what that result is going to be and what you're going to be with it right so that is very 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 key thought for me in 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 my approach to design um when when you start doing this when you're saying that you're doing something for its own sake actually creativity and spirituality start becoming very similar and and the idea is they are both a practice so this was another person this is a founder of the design school at stanford george uh, campbell he said create using creative capacities is like a practice it's like a meditation you have to practice regularly and you can sharpen it and when you practice it your mindset will develop okay so actually creativity is not a race it's a practice it's a it's more like yoga than it is like running a marathon although there are aspects of project could be like a marathon but creativity on its own for me is much more like yoga so in a way the way i would put it more specifically is that i have certain influences and characteristics that i've been brought up with i have a design toolkit now this language that i've developed let's say around workplaces and that has given me a certain frame for life certain approach and all of these together will help me make better better choices as a designer right so this is a really honestly i can't do justice to this idea in, in one minute but this is broadly what i mean okay so once you're saying creativity and spirituality are linked 
then what is important for that creativity is that finding that creative voice, being authentic. If you are not authentic, you are not able to deliver what is important. Authentic doesn't mean you become rigid, but you have to be true to yourself. And then collaboration, I talked about that, is also an art form to find ways to collaborate with people, make yourself accessible, really important. And lastly, I'll just put these uh, together. Um, these are my three biggest learnings for myself. I've become a hybrid. I value my ability to explore intersections. Right now, we're looking at um, education, writing, design, workspaces, speaking, teaching, giving. These are the intersections that I'm exploring. I've had the ability to pivot. I know I'm not going to do just workplaces. There are already a few topics that I want to do in the future. And I've found platforms. Okay, And I think these things are sort of quite important skills. To, to They help a lot in the future. OK, now I'm going uh, to show you this video, um, which is very different. Okay, It talks about, this is for me an example of design thinking in a very different scenario. Um, basically, these are prisoners in the US. And they have been uh, asked to take care of wild horses as a way to tame themselves so that when they go back into society, they are going to be better um, people. And they're unlikely to you know, show their criminal behavior again. And they'll come back into, the, into society. So I would really like you. I would really like to ask you why you think this is design thinking. Watch the video, uh, and then we'll just talk about that for a couple of minutes, and then we'll wind up. Yeah. Seventy-seven percent of prisoners released in America Volume. will be back behind bars within five years. Reoffending is one of the biggest problems facing justice systems around the world, and nowhere is this more apparent than in America, a country that has a quarter of all the world's prisoners. But can wild horses help? You don't feel caged anymore. Definitely I feel like the horse is tame with me sometimes. These men are prisoners and horse whisperers. They teach you a lot about relationships, about hard work, perseverance. Patience. At Arizona State Prison, the inmates trade their handcuffs for horses. They are learning to tame wild mustangs as part of a rehabilitation program. Since it was introduced, reoffending rates amongst those who have completed the program have fallen to 4% over the last five years. Mustangs have been a part of the American West since it, since it began. The horses in the wild, those that are on uh, Bureau of Land Management lands, are protected. But when wild Mustang herds grow too big, they struggle to find enough food and can damage the local ecosystem. To keep the population under control, around 6,000 are rounded up each year. Most end up in government holding pens at a cost of around $49 million annually. But some are broken in and sold on through horse whispering programs like this one. We care for, house, and uh, try to get horses adopted out. My name's Anthony, Anthony Garrison, and my horse name is Flex. I'm in prison for burglary and drugs. I've been in since 2010. I don't get out till February of 2021. My name's Toby, and, and the horse's name is uh, Clyde, from Bonnie and Clyde. I, I'm in for uh, drug possession, and, and I've been in for four and a half years. Drug possession. Uh, four and a half years for simple possession. Six and a half years for simple protest. Yeah. Since the 1970s, successive U.S. governments have encouraged the harshest punishment for some offenses, 
including mandatory minimum sentences for drug-related crimes. This has seen the prison population balloon 500% in 50 years. This program is a drop in the ocean, helping only a small number of inmates. But it's an imaginative solution to help solve the rehabilitation problem in American prisons. The incarceration issue in, in America, it, it's obviously huge. And the difficulty is to, programs like this are really, really not that easy to, to develop. The aim of the Wild Mustang program is to teach prisoners life skills that will prevent them from reoffending. In the long run, this will keep the prison population down. If we can reach a handful of inmates and they don't reoffend, it's a huge saving, not just a monetary saving, but you have a person who has now become a productive part of society. The untamed animals show many similar traits to the inmates. Oh. In the wild, these horses are primarily focused on survival. A lot of the guys that come into prison have this kind of same mindset. There are so many parallels to what, uh, what the horse goes through and what the inmate goes through. The inmate has to learn how to, how to live different. They have to learn how to think different. The basic principle is you make the wrong thing harder to do and the right thing easier to do. Of the 50 inmates who have been released after completing the program, only two have returned to prison. The inmates start taking responsibility for something beyond themselves. Rehabilitation programs like this could help break the cycle of reoffending. Another day, another mile. You've been gone a good long while. I'm just not the same person I was when I first came down. I don't think the same, I don't act the same, I don't react the same. It's taught me to help me with being selfless. This job isn't about me. This job is about this horse right here. As I give up my time, my patience, and my energy, I'm the one who's actually being taught the lessons. Another hill, another climb. Can't afford to lose no time. Pioneering programs like this are time consuming, hard to establish, and can only help a small number of inmates. But they're effective, bucking the trend of reoffending. So, what do you think? Yeah. Any thoughts on this? Why? Why did I, you know, choose to end with this program? What? What is significant about this and and design thinking? There's no designers involved in this program. Yeah, but what is the key, in terms of the process, what, what is the key process that's followed that makes it relevant to, uh, makes it an example of design thinking? That's problem solving is one, but uh, what kind of problem solving? What about the problem solving? Yes, yes. So what is that an example of? What is the word we are looking Yeah, so that's a key insight. And where does that insight come from? That's a key insight that, that the whole program is based on, that the animal's behavior and the person's inmate's behavior has a lot of parallels. Okay, so that's a key insight. Where has that insight come from? Reflection and 
See, that is empathy. That is compassion. That is empathy because you can police these people for security. And he said the incarceration rate has gone up 550 percent. 550 percent over the last few decades it's gone up. Whereas they did this program with 50 people out of which only two people came back into prison. So it, 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 it had like a, you know, 96 percent success rate, which is um, incredible, even though it was such a small program. But the key thing is, it's saying that you can achieve security through empathy. First, the traditional approach to policing is through, you know, you police, you achieve security through policing. Here you are achieving security through empathy. So that is the power, really, of that. And that's what I want to leave you with, is which problems are you going to choose to solve? Because even this very remote program that has nothing to do with our everyday lives, it's so different from where we are. Through design thinking, they found a solution. That's what we call it. It's, you know, design thinking is just a word today like driverless car. Like we don't have a word for driverless car. Like for many years when, before car, the word car was invented, they used to call it a horseless carriage. So they said there's a horseless carriage is, we used to call it, a car was called a horseless carriage, then it became a car. Right now we're calling a driverless car a, a driverless car. Design thinking is a bit like that. It's just another word. But the power of it is the ability to identify, empathize with people, find insights, look for imaginative problem solving, coming up with solutions in different ways, finding collaborations, looking at intersections, looking at cross-pollination, how the two, the, the two arms of the government came together for this to work, right? So anyway, thank you very much. I hope you found it interesting. Do we have time for questions? Or? Yeah, sure. Don't uh, let's not get carried away with our enthusiasm and ask questions which are not kind of relevant to this um, topic that she's dealt with. Are we good with that? Huh? Sure. Truth. I, I think I genuinely am inspired by intersections and curiosity. So I think curiosity takes me to a place where I find new things. I'm, I'm interested. I, I, have no, I know nothing about security, but I found this video of this story. I, I like horses. I, that's maybe the only connection. But, you know, I, I think curiosity is really important. Sorry? That? I mean, too many. So, yeah, yeah, that's all that I'm doing. I think uh, ideas for making things better is always a, is something that I want to know all about. You know, that's very broad, but um, I'm just I'm just really interested in, in I'm interested in that. Um, I'm also really interested in um, kind of both women's issues as well as masculinity. That's like another area of interest, which has not particularly come out here, but maybe it came out a bit in the, the prisoner's video. That's something like that. Interesting. Keep it now because they all, uh, there are lots of people up there. Uh, this is regarding those uh, CEOs stories that we were talking about. Uh, a lot of them which you, so it happens that sometimes individuals have control or a role to play how they define a workspace or they have. Sometimes they do not. For example, see uh, Google when you showed, the company itself has such a strong missions, vision or whatever the principles and you as an individual might not be able to uh, put in your ways of doing it. And it's, it's basically strongly built 
brought in by the management, I mean, the, the entire management itself. So in that situation, what is right? I mean, and also it depends on from individual to individual. Some individuals are that uh, um, strong and dominant that they will go out of the way and change the way if they want to or fight for it. And there are people who would just not want to get into any kind of, uh, uh, you know, they'll just adapt. Like you said, that lady changed the way the orientation was. And why some people will not want to get into that kind of a uh, botheration of changing the workspace as per their personal energy. That does not mean they do not have a personal mm -hmm. energy, but uh, they would do minimalistic, not disturbing mm -hmm. what is already. So what is right as to, I mean, uh, is there any, uh, would you say that there's some kind of a, balance that should be there uh, for not just I would say CEOs but any heads or leaders yeah. to uh, make the right difference at the right place at the right time. Yeah. See, I first of all as generally the average employee is not going to have huge say about whether they can change something or not. Okay, that's one thing. Only when an organization is changing its, uh, its office space or something can they, they ask employees for input. For CEOs, some of them have, some of them, they choose to exercise their liberties, they choose not to. But I find, I think it's very effective, it's a very effective way of communicating to organizations. Just to, just for the four reasons we discussed, it can do a lot of those, uh, I mean, it would benefit a lot of CEOs to take it seriously because environment does make a huge difference, you know, and uh, they, most of them have realized that um, they want to, once they, once they take over, they do end up making that change. Even though, even when they're going to be in their position for like three years, five years, whatever it is, they, they do like to customize it in some way, at least. And I think I would advise that they do it because it sends a song, strong signal about who they are and also it sends a message about working in a more productive way. Okay. Hi, ma'am. Yeah. What are the key points you include while reaching out these people? Sorry? What are the key points? you reach these people oh what criteria yeah. based on with i think generally first of all i try and make sure that they're very credible organizations so that's something and they're going to be there in the long run so that's with the startup environment that doesn't always kind of work out sometimes so you have to you know there's there's so much change happening but the credibility um and then just a, an interesting story something that the readers will in, enjoy and um, you know either interesting organization or a well-known name, something like that. We try and avoid, although we've done some quite plush offices, generally there are, I mean, there are many more very lavish offices we could have done, but we've not done that because we're not just here to show, to make, to sensationalize the whole issue and to see, you know, who's got such a big office. And I, I mean, I could have written out headlines saying, you know, the crores of paintings in so-and-so's office and all that. We avoided all of that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, any uh, design experience other than designing a space, any interesting design experience which you would like to sh share? Or no, I mean, I just went to a lot of conferences and talks and uh, I got a lot of design experience on the ground at BP Ergo because we were coming up with products there, we were innovating, we were doing work on everything from branding to retail to environment to, uh, to product design itself to spaces, everything. So a lot of hands-on experience that time. 